I'd like all of us to uh, bow our heads and our hearts. I'd like us to bow our heads and our hearts, and I want us to begin this moment in prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful word. Holy Spirit, please come. Open up our minds and our hearts to your truth. Give us the ability, the desire, the wonder, Lord, of your word working in our lives. May it not only permeate our minds and our hearts, but also our relationships. May we today, Lord, see what you are saying and experience what you are doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope, hope. Be done the way we'll we agree. Don't worry. I promise. Come, come. said to Abraham, keep my alliance and circumcise each child born unto Israel on the eighth day of his life. Amen. Amen. This is the seal in flesh of the covenant between the Lord and his people. And the child shall be called shall be Jesus. And the nations of the world shall march towards Where is he? <coughs> now I can die contented, Lord. According to thy word. I am Simeon, an old man who has waited long to see his salvation. And now my eyes have seen the child will bring the salvation thou hast prepared before all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people, Israel. The sword shall pierce your heart. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, we find this moment that takes place. This is not a story, this is historical fact. This is the actual culmination of God's work of salvation of bringing hope to this world. Simeon is there waiting, watching, day after day, day after day. His statement is a clue to you and I. 
In verse 22 it says, And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him, Jesus, the child, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for, what does it say? The consolation. The consolation. In Handel's Messiah, you hear the word comfort, 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 comfort over and over and over again. Same word as consolation. Jesus Christ is our comfort. He is our consolation. He is our hope. I want you to understand today what our actual hope is. What our actual hope is. He was the comfort, the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. This is not Jesus' last name. This is the actual function that he performed. At this time, the president-elect is filling his cabinet with people in positions. They are given titles and positions and names. Christ is Jesus' actual title and position. He is the Messiah. He is anointed. He is set apart. He is the Christ. He is God's hope for this entire world. Those who actually came before and those who come after Looking forward or looking back, Jesus is the centerpiece of all history. His birth is the announcement of God's actual comfort, consolation, peace. And Jesus Christ was there at that moment, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, by the way, who named Jesus? His father named him. His father named him. Now, Joseph is naming him at this time because he is also a father in Jesus' life. But the father of heaven gave the name. Jesus and Joseph obediently recognized the father's claim, but also keeping his own position of taking care of Jesus, God's son. I don't want anyone here to ever diminish the position of both Mary and Joseph. Do not diminish Joseph's role. There is no Jesus, there is no Christ without both. You gotta have them both. If you go to my house, one of my favorite pictures hangs above the mantle of my fake fireplace. Remember when we used to have real ones? (laughs) Anyway, it hangs across my fake fireplace. And it is Mary, Joseph, and Jesus together. And Joseph has his tools hung over his shoulder, ready to either come home from work or go to work. I'm not sure what he's doing. But he is also presenting fruit to his wife and child. And uh, it is a beautiful picture to me because remember... God is Christ's father, but Jesus is his stepdad. All you stepdads here today, you should see your position in much better category than maybe you have before. But understand, Jesus is standing in for the heavenly father. Standing in for the heavenly father. They came in to name him, to do for him according to the custom of the law, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in what? Peace. 
That's what hope does. Hope gives us peace. There's some of you here today, you're hurting. I don't know why you're hurting. I know you're hurting. It's important for you <clears throat> to know that Jesus Christ can give peace to hurting people. That Jesus Christ can give comfort to hurting people. That Christ is not just a man. He is God's Christ, God's Messiah, God himself and human flesh. He is the consolation. He is the light. He is the peace. It makes all the difference in the world. I remember one time I was at Barnes Hospital. I was sitting in the corner of the ICU unit because they were giving me a little bit of permission to kind of hang out in the room. They had rules and so on and so forth. And I was being real quiet like a little hospital mouse. You know what I'm saying? And I remember God saying to me, David, she's going to be okay. I didn't always get that. And immediately, a rush of peace just rolled over me. I've, I've experienced that many times in my life. Many times in my life. And it's important for you and I to understand our hope, Jesus Christ, is the source of our peace. And when you have peace, everything's okay. Everything's okay. And, and I want you to know something. It doesn't matter to change history, okay? If you need a certain outcome, then that's not always necessarily going to work out. And I remember when I got done that night, I, I was actually in downtown St. Louis, and I went to get some gas, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was at the gas station. And a guy came up to me, and he said, hey, man, he said, could you spare some change? I said, brother, I'm going to give you everything I got in my pocket. I said, because God has been so good to me, and I just gave it to him, and he just stood there just dumbfounded. He was ready for what? No. Get away from me, you know. And what I'm trying to say to you is this. Jesus Christ gives us peace. Peace. Why? Because he is God. He is God, and those who know him know his consolation, his salvation, his peace in our lives. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light. This morning I was looking for my clothes, and I was trying not to bother everybody in the house. You know what I'm talking about? So I went to my favorite store, Westlake, and I have this little headlamp. I put it on my head, and I walk around in the dark, <laughs> finding my belt. And my, I, I think I did okay. I did, you know, I think they all match. But the bottom line is that, you know, a light reveals everything. A light reveals everything. Those of you that went with us down to Arkansas to rebuild those houses that were destroyed in the tornadoes, uh, you guys remember when we were doing those walls and that guy brought a light over? I hated that light because <laughs> it showed that we weren't done. <laughs> I told him, I said, would you please quit putting a light on that wall? Because <laughs> it looked nice and smooth and so on. If you put a light along that wall, it'll show all the imperfections and so on. That's sometimes a little bit of a problem, isn't it? Sometimes it's a problem to us because you see, Jesus does reveal us for what we really are. But he also shows us where we're going to go Amen. and what he's already got for us and what he's going to do. And I want you to know that that light is a beautiful thing for revelation to the Gentiles. All you Gentiles, raise your hand. If you don't know if you're a Gentile, turn to your neighbor and ask him. <laughs> I just want you to know, my friends, it's a beautiful thing that it says a light to the Gentiles a revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. Notice those two things, a light and glory. Light to the Gentiles, glory to Israel. And it's important for you and I to understand, and does Israel recognize Jesus today? 
Let me ask again. Does, G, does Israel recognize Jesus today? No. They profit off him all the time, but they don't recognize him. And so I want you to understand something, whether you accept this or not. He is still your light. He's still your revelation. He's still your glory. He's still your peace. And here's something I want to ask you. Do you find yourself in the same place year after year after year after year? Well, could I suggest something to you? Why don't you try Jesus? Try Jesus. Try his consolation. Try his light. Try his revelation. Try his glory. Try his peace. I think you'll find it's better than a bottle of Jack. Hello? Or a 12 pack of light. Or a funny cigarette. Or all kinds of manner of things that everybody uses to manage their emotions. But the fact is, is that there's only one thing that'll get yourself really set, and that is to come in touch with your very creator, God, through Christ, his son. And I want you to know that Simeon, I love Simeon. I love what he does. I love what he's about. Here's this guy just sitting there waiting. God told him. Did he have something, you know, previously to say that this was all going to work out okay? No. He didn't have anything. This had never happened before. And he sat there day after day. And you see in the, in the short piece, you can see the filmmakers are putting in that the people of the temple probably kind of thought a little less of him. Because there's this crazy guy just sitting around waiting for something that's never happened before. And I want you to sometimes, I want you to be careful. I want you to be careful and watch out sometimes because the crazy things sometimes are the things that God really works in. The things you've never seen before. And I'm not talking about just, you know, if somebody's crazy, it's got to be God. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you don't always know how God's going to work. But I can tell you this, he almost always works in a way that does not show flesh, but only shows miracle and spirit. He works in ways that you can't explain. He works in ways that cannot explain. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And I want you to see, you know, this is where they came. They came to the temple. They came to Jerusalem. They traveled quite a distance. They brought their child to fulfill everything and to name him and to dedicate him to the Lord. Now I want you, if you would please, to turn with me to Romans 8. Romans 8. I want you to see what this really means and how it is actually explained because Jesus isn't just a birth. He's a prophesied, foretold, born, lived, died, resurrected, now risen Lord. And now he is actually the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he can do amazing things in your life. Notice this in verse 18. All right, Romans chapter 8. Are you with me? Okay. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you get that statement? You get that statement? Almost anything really, really wonderful has an upfront point of pain before it leads to the actual pleasure. The things that really are beneficial in life And I, I, I know there are instantaneous, wonderful things that happen, <clears throat> but by and large, the things that are really wonderful take work up front and bring a result that is better. And I want, I want us to understand something here today because you see, I know some of you are going through hard times. I know some of you are going through hard times. And I just want you to know, do not consider these present sufferings as the only thing you'll ever have. They are just moments. They are just moments. Are we eternal beings or not? Are we eternal beings or not? I, you know, when I do a funeral, I just want to tell people, you know, I want to say, look, you know, I don't know if you guys noticed, but Fidel Castro's funeral, did you notice his casket? Did anybody see it? No? Okay. Am I a weirdo or what? I mean... 
You saw it, Dan? Okay, thank you, brother. I got one person that saw it. All right, but anyway, I, I, you know, I mean, Fidel was probably taller than this. I'm pretty sure he was, you know. And they put him all in that little box there. And uh, he was obviously cremated. And I want you to understand, you know, every one of us, this tenement of clay is going to go away. And the Bible says that this life is short. And those of you that have lived quite a while, one of the things that many of you tell me is that it goes fast. Am I misquoting, folks? Those of you that are the elders of our congregation, would you agree with me that it goes very quickly? I want you to understand this. We are more than this body and this life. There's something more. I think the reason that we're having so much trouble today is because we've told two or three generations of kids that they are nothing more than animals and that their life doesn't matter. And that's why many of them just want to end their lives now because they're having trouble and they don't know that there's something greater coming. Something greater coming. And it's important for you and I to understand. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope, notice, here's the hope. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Do you, do you see what this is actually tying together? It's tying together the literal universe with the reality of the sons and children of God. That the very actual redemption of this universe is when God fulfills everything in his people. Folks, get it down, okay? Get it down. Jesus didn't just come, he's coming back. He's coming back and maybe he hasn't come to your time yet, but he's still coming back. And those who are dead in Christ will rise and meet him in the sky and he will take them all together and every nation will bow, every tongue will confess, everyone will actually recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. Why? Because he is. Not because, not because he has a gun on their head, not because he's threatened them, but because he loves them, because he is who he is. He is the very presence of all the universe and creation is groaning. Okay, I've never been pregnant. <laughs> I better take a drink on that one. <laughs> Okay, but the ladies that have been pregnant tell me they can't wait. <laughs> They're just groaning and waiting. And, uh, you know, it, it's understandable that the Bible actually says that creation is like a pregnant woman waiting for the culmination of God's history. This life is not meaningless, it's meaningful. It's not hopeless, it's hopeful. It is not destined to destruction. It has got God's presence and power. And I want you to know we've tried an experiment, mostly worldwide, to say that God doesn't exist. How's it working out? Not too well. Not too well. And I want you to understand, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. Now I want you to get this, okay? We have the first fruits of the Spirit. So when Jesus Christ came in my life, he saved me, he changed me, he destined me, he gave me something I never had before. And it freaked people out at first. It, it, it enthrilled me. It thrilled me. But I received the first fruits of the Spirit. And then one day, when I breathed my last, 
or Jesus Christ comes again, I will experience the completion of the Spirit in my life. And I want you to understand, this is our hope. This is our hope. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, in this hope, okay? I'm not talking about any other hope. In this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is not, that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is see, what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with what? Patience. Patience. That's hard, isn't it? Patience is hard. Do you guys remember the uh, marshmallow test? Anybody remember the marshmallow test I showed you? That you can see what's going to be a challenge for a young person. If you'll put a marshmallow in front of them and tell them that if they hold off on that, you'll give them two and let them sit there for 10 minutes with that marshmallow in front of them. That's our lives. God has already given us one marshmallow, but there's a whole bag waiting for us. And if you don't like marshmallows, think of something else. But understand this, we are waiting with patience for the consummation and the completion of God's salvation that he began through this light to the Gentiles and glory to Israel. The peace of all mankind. It isn't here yet. It's not completed yet. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Amen. Amen. Anybody here weak? Anybody weak? Anybody weak? I'm going to wait until you come into it. Anybody weak? Anybody weak? All right, finally. Gee whiz. Some of your weakness is raising your hand. But anyway, the bottom line is, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Isn't that great? Okay, I'll read it again. (laughs) Man, you guys are hard to rev up. You know that? I'm going to get like that, that stuff you spray in a carburetor and kind of get you started. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. For those who are called. Now I want you to get this. For those who are called according to his purpose. It's his purpose that is our hope. His purpose that is our hope. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might by the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined, he also called and those whom he called, he also justified and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. Do you see that? He calls, he he predestines, he calls, he justifies and he glorifies. It's easy. All you got to do is believe and you'll graduate with honors. Isn't that beautiful? And I want you to understand. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And what shall we say to these things? For if God is for us, who can be against us? I think we need to join in with David and say, the God of Israel will not be mocked. The God of Israel will give me victory today over Goliath. The God of Israel will stand up and show himself to be actual God. I want to I kind of just read this to you. Anybody ever heard of Isaac Watts? Yes, no, maybe. All right, who is he? He didn't invent the light bulb, so. <laughs> who is Isaac Watts? He wrote 720 hymns, okay, 720 hymns, and he wrote this one. He did not write it for Christmas. He wrote it for the glory of Jesus Christ 
the Lord of his salvation. One of the things about Isaac Watts, in the 16th and 17th century he lived, he wrote about the personal experience of a believer. The personal experience of a believer. And by the way, in the actual war of independence here in the United States, they were so poor as an army that they actually took hymnals from a church that were all Isaac Watts, <laughs> tore the pages out and stuffed them in their guns and used them to be able to make their charges to be able to fight the battle. And that's what they actually would say. They'd say, give them Watts, boys, give them Watts. And this might have been one of the things that came out of their barrel. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature, heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with what? Truth and grace and makes the nation prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Let no more, let sins grow, sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, for as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. My friends, confident expectation, the hope of Jesus Christ, that is our hope. Amen? All right, let's stand together. As we sing together, raise up your hearts. Raise up your hearts. Let your mind dwell upon the Word of God. Let your heart be taken by the Holy Spirit. Let your body be in, in a throne of God. And let yourself embrace the reality of God himself today in your life. I encourage you today as we sing, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Amen.